This time on the Highland Woodworker. I've never found anything in woodworking that I've not been afraid to attempt. Master woodworker David Sapp invites us inside his state-of-the-art workshop and shows us how he uses modern and antique tools to assist with bringing this marvelous chest it was built in circa 1680 back to life. It's tea time with Popular Woodworking Magazine. Watch how these golf ball holders can help you get a grip in solving a common problem with some small projects. These stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I get all my fine woodworking tools, supplies, and resources at Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's like Disneyland for a woodworker. But if you can't get to Highland Woodworking, you can go to highlandwoodworking.com and you can take advantage of all the great brands and their wonderful customer service. When it comes to woodworking and wood turning and even CNC, David Sapp can do it all. His passion for the craft is what drives him to create beautiful work, teach others his techniques, and build a great community of woodworkers and wood turners. Let's go to his Nashville area workshop and find out how he does it all in our moment with a master. David Sapp. Charles Brock. Oh. Welcome to my shop. This is just wonderful. Thank uh, you. It looks like you do almost any kind of woodworking here. I see CNC, I see antiques, I see turning a massive amount of tools. <laughs> you're, you're David Sapp, the woodworker. Yeah, I've, uh, I've never found anything in woodworking that I've not been afraid to attempt. So it just depends on, uh, I don't specialize in any one thing. If, I, if, if somebody asks me, I tell them I specialize in making sawdust. Well, undoubtedly, you've always looked for opportunities. I mean, as a, as a kid, you must have been kind of the same kind of guy developmentally. Yeah, you know, we, we always, uh, you know, we lived on a farm or we lived on some land, we had a shed. Uh, so my little brother and I would always find ourselves in the shed with a hammer and a nail make, trying to make something. Uh, my grandfather was a carpenter and we'd tag along with him and you know, he'd give us some you know, bits of wood and a hammer and nails to uh, <laughs> mostly keep, a, keep us out of his way. <laughs> but uh, but we, always, we always liked to be doing something with our hands. Mm -hmm. I have the second uh, circular saw that my grandfather ever owned. And it's the second saw because his first one got stolen. And the story was he, he drove up to the job site one day and the house that they were building had a hipped roof on all four sides. Mm -hmm. So there were compound rafter cuts in, in the late 40s, they would have cut those by hand. Wow. And uh, Grandpa said, I am not cutting those rafters by hand. So he went and bought his second Porter Cable circular saw. And, uh, and I have that over there on the shelf as a, it's a constant reminder of grandpa. Wow. Yeah. So, and you have a draw knife. Yeah, so, so I have a draw knife that's from my grandfather, from Grandpa Virgil's father, Grandpa Everett. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had stayed with, uh, and kind of stayed in the family through the years. And so I actually um, dug that draw knife out when I started making Windsor chairs because I needed a draw knife that was sharp. Yeah. And most of the draw knives you find at garage sales have been out in the, you know, the rust and the sheds and, you know, they're, they're not very sharp, but Grandpa Everett's was. Uh, it's an old W.C. Bailey uh, draw knife that, uh, that I can make, it can make wood go away in a hurry. So you had this uh, desire to be a woodworker and, and do projects. What really launched you into, hey, I got to build a shop and, and got you to this point? Yeah, so it, you know, it started with the the white bunny uh, memo holder that I made in Cub Scouts in third grade, mm -hmm. and it just so it became you know something that I enjoyed doing and always wanted to do. So 
and even though I had to provide for the family and you know and put food on the table, I always had the shop going, and we always talked about how do we get um, how do we get into something you love. And they say if you love what you're doing, then it's not a job anymore. So we we kind of approached it in that fashion, and then eventually found uh, you know our own uh, tool business. Mm -hmm. And um, you know my dad had been an entrepreneur, and I was an entrepreneur, so. We opened a tool business and never looked back. I speak from uh, experience that you really have helped build a great community of woodworkers and wood turners mm -hmm. in, in Tennessee. Uh, that's a very valuable skill. Yeah, yeah, we've been, uh, I've been a member of the TW since 2003 mm -hmm. and uh, have been part of almost every symposium that we put on you know, held lots of positions within the club mm -hmm. because it's a, you know, it's a great community of wood turners. And, um, you know, you get to see a lot of stuff uh, at the meetings. Uh, people bring work in to share at the meetings, talk about what they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, ask questions. And I just really enjoy sharing my skills with, uh, with the other people in the, in the club as well. Today, uh, you're working on a special project. Yeah, I have, a, I have a chest in my shop that was built in circa 1680 is what we think. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a chest that's very similar in the Boston Museum of Fine Art up mm -hmm. in Boston. And it's dated back to that 1680 time frame. Mm -hmm. And all of the details on the chest that's in my shop and the chest that's in the museum are uh, very, very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, a maker named Tracy. So we're able to look at pictures of that chest to uh, replicate uh, the chest that we're working on there uh, now. This guy is made uh, almost exclusively out of chestnut. So all of the pieces are uh, on here are chestnut. Uh, even, you know, the little piece of tape there holding a, a piece that's uh, kind of getting ready to fall off. But um, so the chest was originally sold, taken to a shop that was going to be repaired. And so the repair guy there at that shop, um, Alan, stripped everything off of it that he thought wasn't original. So if he saw a saw mark on it, or he saw something that would have been uh, too finely made, he just stripped it all off. So that's why there's a lot of pieces that are missing. And so if you come over here to the doors, and you look at these doors, he, he actually took the door on the right here, is just completely off the chest. And so we asked ourselves, why would he take that door off the chest and just leave it there? And then this other door, the door that's on the left, you can see that you know, it's missing the moldings. And on the outside of the chest, it looks pretty good. But if you flip the, the door over, you can see on the back side, uh, it looks like they just hacked this guy out with a hatchet. It's rough. And, um, and then some of the other things that we looked at when we were comparing the two doors, so the, the door on the right only has a single pin. This guy has got two pins on it. And we think that, that the style missing on the left half over here is missing because when they replaced this door, they put hinges on it. And in the original cabinet, you can see holes here where they wouldn't have had hinges, it, the door pivoted on would have been wooden dowels. And so we're pretty sure that Alan stripped the left style off of this door um, to replace that style because they would have added hinges to that. That if you look at this, um, what we say the newer door, if you look at the back of this, it's just too well made to be an original 1680 door. Um, it's just, you know, there's no, now they also use blue putty, but you can see everything is done uh, planed uh, and done pretty well. And if you look at a lot of the pieces um, on here, you, if you look back, um, feel in behind that, you can tell that they just, they, they took no care with the inside of the chest. They spent all of their time focusing on the outside of the chest. And then if you look at these, these original turnings, so you can see on this turning here, you know, when they hacked that out, they just, they had a piece that was missing and they just left that on there. And I'm sure that they would have spun that to the inside so that you couldn't see it, but they didn't worry about the fact that 
there's a piece missing in the turning. Um, and then if you look at this guy, this is oval because that was, that's all one piece of wood. Mm -hmm. So as the wood dried, it would have turned into an oval and they just left it as that and, um, and kept it going. And then we're uh, pretty sure that the finish on all of this is just a milk paint. Um, and it's kind of a, a black and a red um, milk paint that they would have put on there to achieve the effect that they've uh, that they've got going. Kind of like you'd find on some old Windsor chairs. Exactly, yeah. The very the very same finish. Now this is the uh, the top of the chest. Uh, the bottom of the chest over here are. Um, that you can see there are the three drawers. The drawer on the top, we, uh, we're pretty sure is the bottom. And so it had a lot of damage from, um, you know, being down in the mud. Uh, we got this thing out of a barn in Wisconsin. And so the, the chest I've taken apart in um, a lot of the pieces I'm gonna have to rebuild because a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the tenons that are on the piece have broken off. So you can see that the, the tenon here is broken off. So that's gonna have to be um, replaced. So I'll, I will uh, I'll mortise in a new tenon and put a, a, a false tenon in there. A lot of the panels had to have uh, pieces of wood glued back onto them. So uh, you can see again on the back of all of these guys that this is very rough, but they didn't worry about the back of the panel they spent all of their time worrying about the front of the panel. So I had to replace some pieces of wood inside the pan on the panels. Um, this panel is the only intact panel uh, on the piece. And some of them, well, like this one and this one, I had to replace pieces on three sides. Um, but I glued those on there with hide glue. And then eventually I'll take, I'll use Grandpa Everett's draw knife. Right. And we'll, uh, we'll make all of this stuff match and then be able to, uh, to put it back together. But this um, bottom rail here, you can see again, the back side of this piece is, uh, is hacked out pretty well. Both of the tendons are missing off of this. So I'll repair this piece. On the other side of the chest, this piece is completely missing. So this will have to be a new piece. So I'll, I'll um, make this uh, match this, but then I'll take the draw knife and I'll try to replicate what they've done in 1680 by making the back side of this look ugly. I see. And yeah. That's a really hard thing to do when you pride <laughs> yourself in being a really good woodworker is to take a nice right. piece of wood and make it look like you hacked it out with a hatchet. Well, it wasn't easy to find a uh, wormy chestnut either, was it? No. Now, I, I had one piece of chestnut um, that I've, I've had probably for 15 or 20 years and I just held on to it thinking mm -hmm. one of these days it's going to be useful for something and, right. and so today's the day. The, this bigger 2 by 8 used to be a rafter in a barn and uh, I found it at a local wood store who the guy salvaged uh, old barns and then sells them you know today in the, the world of making tables that stuff can be uh, pretty valuable and it was oh, very yes. valuable. Uh, to be able to uh, to find that, but if you look at uh, if you look at the color, so that's the outside of that where I just planed the paint off of it. But if you flip it over like this, you can see on the inside that color that you can see there doesn't appear overnight. That's been there for um, yeah. That's wonderful. Years patina of, uh, there. Yeah, years but it's, of patina. And it's only a step toward right. This. Right. Yeah. So all of this will, you know, once, once I get it all put back together, um, then it'll be the finishing process of trying to, to rematch the, uh, the finish that's on the chest to make it look uh, back like it did in 1680. David, how would you like to be remembered? What, what do you think, uh, think of David Sapp? What would you like others to think? Well, just that, you know, here's a guy that, uh, that always enjoyed woodworking and was never uh, afraid to share uh, what his knowledge was, what his skills were, and that always liked to be around other people who uh, shared the same passion.
Later in the show, we'll head back to David's workshop for a special turning lesson. But first, see why popular woodworking magazines, tips, tricks, and techniques segment may have you searching your golf bag for some pointers. Don't go anywhere. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here, and I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading band saws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power Tools. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside Router Bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a Whiteside Router Bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. Whenever you're ready to apply finish to a small project, the last thing you want to do is set the wet finish down right on your workbench or even on a piece of paper. What can happen is as the finish dries, it essentially glues the project in place. Then you have a mess that you just have to clean up. However, you can create a temporary finishing station right on your workbench using just a scrap piece of pegboard and a handful of golf tees. Here's how it works. Take the golf tees and fit them through the holes in the pegboard. Now when you set it back down, the pegboard stabilizes the golf tees and keeps them from flipping over. Now you can take the project and set it in place right on the tees. The sharp points of the tees won't leave anything but tiny dimples in the product bottom of a project. So that means you can apply a coat of finish to the bottom and there's plenty of air circulation to allow to, the finish to dry perfectly. A finishing station like this is like a clear shot right down the center of the fairway. Well, I'm ready to cut. In fact, I'm ready to cut anywhere in the shop or the job site with my Bora Speed Horse XT Sawhorses. <laughs> These are the Cadillac of sawhorses. Not only are they strong, they'll hold up to 1,500 pounds. They're so easy to set up and so versatile. Uh, you get 45 inches of beam length and you can set it from 30 inches in height all the way up to 36 inches. So there's some jobs that you don't want to break your back bending over. You need a little more height and the speed horses, they'll give you what you need. Gravity is your friend setting up the speed horse. Look at that. Then the other side opens up. 
It's as easy as that. You can adjust the Bora Speed Horses each leg in one inch increments, uh, all the way up to that 36 inches. If you're on ground that is not level, you can drop the leg down or raise up the leg that you need to make it level. By adding some two by fours or two by sixes, uh, I can increase my work surface and even put a piece of plywood up here or just work at a higher level. The folks at Bora, they know what you need in your workshop or on the job site. Think of Bora Speed Horse XTs when you need a portable work surface. Coming up, David Sapp turns a turning. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. There's four words that Lee Tools lives by. Four words that mean quality joinery to take your projects to the next level. Whether it's dovetails, box joints, or mortise and tenon. And we'll even help you clean up. Those four words, better tools, better results. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. Well, David, earlier in the show, we, we talked about the project and it's gonna require some patching. And you've done so uh, in this little piece that fits here. And how are you going to blend that in? Yeah, and well, you can see that this is a, a piece of quarter sawn chestnut that went on the front of that chest and it was all rotted because this sat down on the ground. So our, mm -hmm. our turning had a rotted piece. So I, I took this and, and glued it back in. And once we apply the finish to that, it's amazing how, so if you looked at that drawer from a distance, you would say it looks fine. Right. But if you look at it up close, you can see right from there to there that that was all a patch, uh -huh. that they did something. And I'm not sure what happened here, but somehow they patched the front of this drawer. And unless you really study that close, you'll yeah. never know that that patch is there. And so my goal when we get done with this 
if you look at where, um, especially like right here where I made that cut right there, you can see below that the turning will hide almost all of that. The turning will still hide some of this um, split wood here and then this turning will go over that hole and you'll, you'll never be able to tell that that's there by the time we color it and we get going. With and the it, grain orientation for the, uh, the patches is, is almost perfect. Yeah. So yeah, great job. Yeah, and it's, it's not true quarter sawn, but you know, so you can see the flex there from the quarter sawn, but the grain lines up and the flex, um, the turnings will hide the fact that there are no flex in that piece there from there. So, but we, we do need to go back now. So you've got this turning that's missing the lower portion of it. And then on the front of the lower chest, there's another 12 turnings that are completely missing and we need to replace those 12 turnings. So we gotta return and replicate this turning uh, six times, because as we make it six, we're gonna split them in two and make that be 12. All right, I wanna see that. Okay, let's go, yeah. well, let's go make that happen. All right. Well, David, we're at the, your one-way lathe, and you've got a piece chucked up here, and you're gonna make one of these and cut it in half? Mm-hmm. Yeah, tell yeah. us about it. So, so the first thing, um, we, we planed the back side of one of the original spindles and mm -hmm. figured out that this is red maple. Mm -hmm. So we went out and found some red maple and um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn one of these. Now the secret here is that we know that the major diameter on this whole piece is seven eighths of an inch. And I'm leaving a piece on each side of it that's seven eighths of an inch and I can put that against the bandsaw fence Mm -hmm. I'll line the grain up and now I can run it right down the bandsaw and these two pieces that I leave on here give me everything that I need to be able to cut that right in half on the uh, on the bandsaw. All right, that's in, a good tip. In 1680, they probably would have done this by hand, but in 2022, we have a bandsaw that helps us do that. And then once we get it cut in half, then we'll just put the uh, block plane on the mm -hmm. bench and we'll plane that smooth and we'll be able to apply those right to the front of the chest. They might have done it by hand and foot. <laughs> they might have, they might have. So, um, so let's get, uh, put my safety glasses on here. And the first thing that we wanna do, because we know that the major diameter of this piece is seven eighths of an inch, um, we're gonna use this gauge and we're gonna turn this piece down to seven eighths of an inch. <clears throat> we're gonna use the spindle roughing gouge to make that happen. I'm going to rub the bevel and I'm going to make this guy be round. So all I'm doing here is knocking the corners off, always cutting downhill. And as I get the, uh, the corners knocked off, Get the knife here to go the other way. I'm going to turn around and go back the other way. Now, my goal here is now to get this down to seven eighths of an inch. And one of the things when we're uh, when we're turning, so there's my seven eighths. I know that that is seven eighths of an inch. So that gives me a, a clue when I'm turning of where I need to be. Kind of a benchmark. Mm -hmm. So now in 1680, they wouldn't have sanded any of this stuff. So I'm not quite there. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch to my skew because I wanna make this look like it's not sanded. So if you look at this now, um, you can still see there's some lines in there and stuff like that. So we wanna make it look to the point where it's not sanded. And the skew is basically the hand plane for the lathe. So.
You'll see the bevels rubbing. I've got the cutting edge presented to the wood about 45 degrees there. And now if you look at that cut, you can see that, and you can, if you feel that, you're not gonna improve on that finish much with sandpaper. There you go. So we need to double check that we're, we're not quite at seven eighths. So another little uh, trimming cut. A little heavier on this end because we're a little fatter than seven eighths on this end. Okay, we're gonna call that good. I took the pattern and I created a story stick just on a piece of poster board. So I'm gonna put the story stick up against the spinning piece of wood and I'm gonna mark the major and the minor diameters on this. We've got a couple of spots there, 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 and then that's the overall length. So that gives me all of my relative points that I want to uh, work on as I get going. Now what I've got to do is basically create, um, I know that the, the major diameters on all these pieces are 7 eighths of an inch. And I've, I've looked at the overall spindle, made it 7 eighths of an inch, so I don't have to mark any more major diameters, but I do have to mark a couple of minor diameters, one here, one here, and then um, one at the end of the piece. So we're going to do that with the uh, parting tool. So the first one I'm going to cut, uh, I'm actually going to make just a cut at both ends. Um, make sure I don't get, and what this is going to do is going to define both ends for me. Then I've got um, a caliper set for this minor diameter right there. So I'm going to come right here, I'm going to hold the calipers over the top, and go in. So those calipers come loose like that. I have another uh, caliper that's set for that diameter right there. And so here, um, so on the right side of the mark, I'm going downhill that way. And then on the left side, I'm going downhill to the uh, other side of that. So I'm gonna come just to the right of that mark. And I'm gonna part in. That basically sets the right hand side of that mark. And the other diameter that I need to mark is the width of my bead, which is on the top of this guy right here. So just on the center of that, it's the diameter of my bead. So now I don't need <laughs> any more gauges. I just need to um, make the turnings go from there. So I'm going to use my skew. Um, if you look at that, there are two lines. So there are the two score marks that we see on the original piece. Now from that score mark, up, uh, whoops, we're going to basically make a taper. And that taper goes from that first score mark down to the bottom of that piece that we had. So you'll notice that I, I can't just start at the, the slice that I made there and go to the bottom. That I have to take a little bit off each time to create that taper that goes down through there. Then I'm going to go through, the, through that part mark right to, up to the edge of that piece right there. So now that creates that taper that we've got going there. Now if we look at the, um, the piece there, so we have these two beads that we have to, to create there. Mm -hmm. So I need, a, I need to take some of this wood out of the way. Um, and I'm gonna make a V cut. So I'm gonna make a V cut right here. Slice. 
Let me get some of this wood out of my way. And this, uh, these minor diameters here are done pretty much by eye. So I can kind of look at that and see um, what I need to get going on there. So here's the other side of that bead right there. I'm going to do the same bead cut here. And I can look over the top and see, okay, am I about the same depth there? And I get that, uh, that guy going there. Now I'm going to switch to my 3 8 inch spindle, rough, or spindle gouge. And I'm going to make uh, the remainder of these elements. So if I look here, I need to make a cove in the middle of that guy. From between those two lines, there's got to be a cove. So I'm going to start in the middle. I'm going to make a cove. So the bevel's rubbing right there. I just drop my hand out. I raise into the cut. Bring that around. I look over the top and make sure that my Cove looks consistent from a circle standpoint. And again, remember in 1680, they wouldn't have had sandpaper. So I've got to make this cut to the point where the, with the bevel rubbing. It's a finished cut. I, it's a finished cut. I don't have to sand. Yeah, nice. So now there's my cove is finished. So now I need to make the bead on both sides of that. So now I'm going to start here. I'm going to roll that bead on that side. Right down into there, I'm going to come over here and I roll the bead on this side, right down into there. And so that creates that element. Now, on this base here, I've got to roll this bead over. Roll that right down and tuck that right in there. So that's good. So now on the end, uh, I have a bead here, so I'm going to bring that down to the, uh, to the mark. So that's the top half of my bead, and if you look here, I have a cove that comes mm -hmm. off of that bead. So I'm going to do the same thing here, I'm going to start that cove. The cove starts off the bottom of that bead, and then it comes into the ball element that's on the end of that piece. So that ball element on the end of the piece is basically the bottom half of the piece. So I start to define that ball. The ball comes back over this way, rolls into a cove, comes off the top of this bead rolls into the toe and then the other half of this bead gets tucked over into that side like that. So that's the lower element. So the only thing I've got left to do now, and I'm going to use my spindle roughing gouge just to clear a little bit of this wood out. Now remember, we've got to go from that edge of the piece down in a line to the point that we made there. And we're going to go from this edge of the piece down to the line that we made here on the other side. So my spindle roughing gouge can get a lot of the wood out of the way and I've got it in my hand so that's what I'm going to use. But to fine tune that, I'm going to use my smaller skew. And go from that first line down, straight down to the point that way. And then one cut down the hill like that. 
And there we go. Wow. And, and so now when we, and when we go to the chest, we'll take this piece, we'll cut this piece in half, mm -hmm. and we'll put those two pieces side by side. They'll look exactly the same. Yeah. And then if you go to the other side of the chest, if they're not exactly the same, the eye will make them the same. The eye likes for everything to look the same. So as long as I don't completely exaggerate where the major and minor diameters are at, mm -hmm. the eye will say those spindles all look exactly the same. I think it's going to reconcile beautifully with, with the others. This has just been wonderful. Well, thank, thank you, you so Charles. much. Uh, you are really an artist with that skew. Yeah. I, I wish I was that good. I'm going to go practice. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of the Highland Woodworker. Be sure to check us out on social media. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.